is a complicated topic. I don't think you really crack down on homosexuality. You can't stop it. You can prevent it from happening openly. If the relationship is not causing a problem, generally we don't do anything with that. Um, if they are not openly having sex, and I'm saying you can have a relationship that doesn't have sex involved. But Mason believes it's the lack of sex that leads to the unrest among inmates. That frustrates these dudes. It's not a man that I know from 8 to 80 right now that wakes up and don't have an erection in the morning time because that's what happens. We're dealing with reality. So when a man wakes up, first thing comes to the man's mind, damn, I wish I was on the street. Damn, I miss my wife. But behind bars, sex can be a combustible concoction of desire, desperation, homophobia, and predatory behavior, especially at prisons as notorious as California's Pelican Bay. This is the last place they need to be sending a flamboyant homosexual as Pelican Bay. Inmate Adolph Green was out on the Pelican Bay yard when our producer noticed him and asked for an impromptu interview. I'm flamboyant homosexual, the ones that prefer to try to fix itself up like a, a girl. And we call each other girls. You understand? And some of the dudes around here, they call you girl, they come here girl, and this and that. But then you have those that uh, smile in your face and laugh at you behind your back. You walk around the track and you hear somebody call, look at that punk, that bag. That's a bunch of disrespect day in and day out. Green told us that those who are open about their sexuality face retribution from other inmates. You have people that are undercover. You got people that are hiding in the closet, that's doing each other. But the minute they see somebody that's flamboyant, that's out, that they don't understand, then they have something against that. And to go through this here every day, every day, with a bunch of people telling you what you can and can't do, who you can live with and who you can't live with because of your sexual preference is wrong. Because half of the ones telling you not to do it are the ones that's doing it in the closet. And in this environment, sexual partners can turn into blood enemies in the blink of an eye. In here, you don't have no friends, I suppose. Because you can laugh and you can sit up and talk and play cards and dominoes and whatnot, but the minute something happens to you, they all go the other direction, lead you to die. And they got a lot of people up in here to call each other loved ones. I love you, I got love for you, you my homeboy. But the minute you do something that they don't like, they'll cut you. That's what Pelican Bay is about. But we've met many openly gay inmates who have little or no fear about being who they are. Yeah, they call me Amy. Uh, I chose that name, you know. Uh, I want to live my life as a girl. I've always felt like I was a girl. When we met Matthew Campbell, he was serving 12 years for armed robbery and assault at Kentucky State Penitentiary. But his troubles began much earlier. First time I went to jail was 15 years old. I burned the elementary school down. And uh, <laughs> it's pretty much downhill from there. And as an openly gay man, Campbell's time behind bars has had its challenges. Being gay in prison is, is really hard. I mean, it's hard enough to do time in here, but the fact that everybody knows that you're gay, it is constant pressure for, you know, sex. You have a lot of people here that, now that they're in prison, they result to what they have to as far as sex. I have to say there's very few people here that are gay on the streets and gay in here as well. Um, there's a lot of people that say they don't mess around, but then when they get you by themselves, it's like, hey, man, what's up? One of the things that struck me about Matthew was how comfortable he was in his own skin. I mean, here's an openly gay inmate in a southern prison, and he didn't have any problems with it. But when we went out to the yard to try and get some B-roll of Matthew uh, playing backgammon, it became clear that a lot of the other inmates did have a problem with him being openly gay. Come on, shorty. Some people just were avoiding him, and he was actually calling out to them. Are you scared? And it wasn't until the cameras went away and we backed off a little bit that people were willing to come up and get involved in the game with him. In spite of the hardships, Campbell told our producer that prison has played an essential role in his life. If I hadn't came to prison, I would have probably ended up dead. Now my family knows I'm gay. You know, I told all of them when I came here 
So, you know, they all know what to expect from me now. And then, you know, it's like I told them, it's going to be a different person. But before Campbell can prosper on the outside, he'll have to learn how to deal with perhaps his greatest temptation. And it has nothing to do with his sexuality. I'm fascinated with guns. You know, I, I find guns fascinating. And, you know, it's, I get a gun in my hand, it's like, you know, it's, it's trouble. Coming up on Lock Up Raw, Prison Love. We've been together about two years. I'm the wife. <laughs> <laughs> they're not only lovers, they're loan sharks. Mostly everybody in here has some type of hustle. And later, the unique complications of a wedding behind bars. Oh. You have the ring to, to put on your hand. Ring. Oh my God, the best ring. Get the wedding <laughs> These girls right here is my homies in town. Yeah, damn right. right. Some of us been together here four years, some of us been together five <laughs> years, some of us been together, together a long time on relationship. You see what I'm saying? If male inmates look for sex in secret, we found a different story when we visited the North Carolina Correctional Institution for Women. The female offender has a lot of needs, and part of that is to feel that someone cares about them. And that has a lot to do with them bonding. Because a lot of women have been abused, when the first time that they see somebody they think they care about them, they run to it. They don't take time to see if that person's really good for them or not. As a result, the prison places strict limits on intimate relationships. Ladies, y'all put some space in between y'all. It is a rule violation for inmates to have sex in prison. I love you! When we uh, see it, then they are punished um, because of that. We can't have it. But we met one group of inmates willing to share their secrets for skirting the rules. They were led by Don Braswell, known around here as Heavy D. You mostly have 10 fours in here. Yeah, you very Somebody that you can. 10 fours is uh, like another inmate. Like I say, Chelsea, man, 10 four for me and my girlfriend, man, while I go in here. You I'm going to fall saying? out and have a seizure before. So she's going to fall out and have a seizure. It's just easy to get them to. Full form where you can give them maybe two or three cigarettes or a pack of coffee, some stand there and watch. And some police knows what you're doing, so they don't care. That's why I tell you, the police, you got some police that's down with inmates and some police that's against inmates. While some inmates sneak away for quick sex, others, like Kathy Phillips and Devin Gann, seek long-term relationships. We have a good relationship. We've been together about two years. And for a relationship in here, it's good. Known couples aren't usually housed together. Mm -mm. But we manage to connect sometimes. You know? Yeah, there's a way around everything. <laughs> when we met them, Kathy was 42 years old and serving 14 to 17 years as a habitual felon, with multiple counts of forgery, larceny, and resisting officers. Devin was 25 years old and serving 9 to 12 years for second degree murder. It was a man that I lived with, he was a drug dealer. It was a robbery gone bad, and he got killed, and I left the crime scene with the guy who killed him because I was, it was a bad situation. But in prison, the two women seem to have discovered a comfort zone. You get in here and you don't have anybody, you don't have anything, so you just sort of cling to somebody. And women are more affectionate or whatever yeah. anyway, so yeah. it looks like normal couples on the streets, but it's all women. Some look like boys. So Yeah, they shave their head and they walk around like a little boy. Yeah, they even hold themselves like there's yeah. something yeah. down there. But any relationship in prison involves towing the line. A new couple is like the staff sort of zone in on them, give them a hard time. But then after a while, it's like, you know, they just get used to seeing you as a couple and they sort of ease off. I mean, you can't you know, kiss in front of them or do a sex act in front of them, but they're not on you for every little thing. I respect the staff. They got their job to do, so I don't cross that line. In spite of rules against it, Kathy and Devin appear to be a picture of domestic bliss. I'm the wife. <laughs> <laughs> we spend our money together. I shop and get our stuff and cook our food every day and make sure she has her stuff. We do everything together, everything. You know, so whatever she's involved in, I'm involved in. Yeah. That includes the family business. Kathy and Devin are not only lovers, they're loan sharks. Whatever you give them, they, they owe you double. I started out with 
Uh, put the 10 out, pulled in 20 the next week, put the 20 out, pulled in 40 the next week, and I just kept doubling until I got on my feet and got stable. And it's, it's a good hustle. Mostly everybody in here has some type of hustle because, I mean, a lot of people don't have help from home. And you have to survive in here. Prison's not free. They give you three meals a day and a bar of state soap, and that's about it. All your hygiene, your food, if you don't want to eat what's in the dining room, you pay for it. And if you don't have anybody on the outside sending you money, the only jobs here you can make money off of is probably 40 cents a day. 40 cents a day will never support you. So people do all kinds of stuff to make hustles. If they don't have somebody on the outside. But there's all kinds of hustles. And loan sharking is one of them. But the loan shark lovers insist they never use muscle to extract payment. If somebody doesn't pay me, I generally just, yeah. I, I mark it up as a loss. I just don't deal with them no more. I tell my friends that Long Shark don't deal with them. You got some people in here that'll bust them in the head with a lock or something. Um, I, ain't, I ain't down with that. Devin told us that she used to run an even riskier business. Before her, I had my own hustle that was pretty much um, staff related. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I would find weak staff, whoever I found in here, because they obviously can't find somebody on the streets to get hooked up with. And then I would play them to get some money. And then what? I'd continue to get money. Then she'd have them fired. <laughs> Devin believes that the officers she seduced deserve their punishment. I have no remorse when it comes to that. I feel as though it's some type of perverted injustice. When you come in here and you think you can get a free lick off of an inmate and you have access to the free world, yeah. I've gotten a lot of money that way. Yeah. <laughs> but I've kind of cut that out in this relationship. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm retired. <laughs> as close as Kathy and Devin were, they told us they have no illusions about a future together. We take it day by day. Yeah. There's no promises of forever or nothing like that. We're very realistic in our relationship. There's a lot of dreams and wishes, but we know that those aren't realistic. You know, we'll I just have, enjoy today. Yeah. Next on Lock Up Raw, Prison Love. I, Raul, take the Leticia. I, Raul, take the Leticia. Exchanging vows when the groom is locked up. And later, when visitation includes sex, emotions run high. We're gonna go ahead and let you take one of these ones. I need both of those. You can't tell me that I can't use my personal hygiene for my body. I need both of those. Raul and Leticia. Today is a very special day for both of you because today marks the beginning of your new lives together as one. Under the best of circumstances, marriage can be challenging, even more so when it begins behind the walls of one of the nation's most dangerous maximum security prisons. Yeah, I can't even touch her or nothing. So you can't even uh, um, consummate the marriage. The groom, Raul Vidal, has been in California's Pelican Bay State Prison since age 18. I was involved in gang, and in street gang, you know, drugs, violence, all that. We got into a shootout. Uh, there were six guys in the car they said I shot at. They were hit and all that, so they, they gave me uh, six life terms for that. Because of his gang affiliation, Vidal is assigned to the secured housing unit, where contact visits are not permitted. Right now, here together, you stand free and apart from all other people in this world, because right now you stand within that charm circle of your love together. Stand Vidal and his bride, Leticia Jaime, were childhood friends and had reconnected five years earlier. Though it's unlikely Vidal will ever be free, Leticia agreed to marry him anyway. Her son, Ruben, stood in as best man. Um, he has a ring to, to put on your hand. Okay. Oh, my God, the dog ring. Get the wedding. <laughs> she seen me, the person inside, that I'm a human being. She opened up her house, her heart. She gave me her family. Hi, Raul. Take the Leticia. Hi, Raul. Take the Leticia. <laughs> to be my wedded wife. To be my wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold to this day forward. I'm the black sheep of my family. 
I'm the only one ever been to prison. Hi, Leticia. Take the role. To be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. I've been thinking about the sacrifice she made, you know, the, how much she loves me to do something like that. As you take this ring and place it on her hand, Raul, will you repeat after me? I give you this ring. I give you this ring. As a symbol and commitment in marriage. She knows that uh, the possibility of getting out are slim to none. And she accepted that. This is the first day of the rest of your lives together. And we would all hope that tomorrow would be even happier. You may kiss your lovely bride. Though there will be no reception or first dance for this couple, the odds aren't totally against them. According to one study, unions in which one partner is incarcerated are less likely to end in divorce than a conventional marriage. But it gives me the hope, it gives me to feel love. She's just a friend, I'm a friend, and uh, you know, we just got married so, to show love for each other. Lock up raw prison love. This being cuddled up with a female makes you appreciate the little things in life. A rare night of physical intimacy for a convict and his wife. And later. I begin to hear people talk about, oh, oh, she's got sentenced to death. She's gonna die for the crime that she committed. Identical twins divided by death row. Prison inmates don't have a lot to look forward to, so visitations are a big deal. For some of these inmates, you know, they haven't seen a child or a wife or a parent in years, so it's a very dramatic time when they come to visit them. And in lockup, these visitations have provided some of the most compelling moments in the series. And few visitations provide as much drama as conjugal visits, when an inmate is allowed an overnight stay with his spouse. It makes you appreciate the little things in life. <laughs> when we met Ron Golden at California's Kern Valley State Prison, he was serving a 22-year sentence for armed robbery and assaults on correctional staff. He claimed that his recent marriage to a childhood friend helped turn him around. Before I was married, I was, I was always in a lot of fist fights and rides or whatever, you know, in and out of hole. Golden's improved behavior earned him the right to a 46-hour conjugal visit with his wife in one of the prison's family cottages. But before the visit begins, Hope Golden must pass through security. Do you have your ID? It's in here. Right. Can you get it for me? It's inside in the envelope. Can you get it for me? Okay. When Ron's wife, Hope, showed up, we thought we'd just get shots of her being processed, coming through the metal detector, opening her bag, getting shots of her and the CO there going through her things. Then it turned into a bit of a, uh, a scene. OK, baby oils can't go in either. That wasn't on the list. That's a lubricant. Like, this isn't factory sealed. It can't go in. Everything has to be factory sealed. And this is not in a clear bottle, and it's unopened, okay. and it contains alcohol. Everything that is made like that has alcohol in it. Anything that contains alcohol, it specifies in the rules. Everything just about has alcohol in it. It appeared that the, some of the things that she was bringing in were not allowed, and Hope was not very happy about that. So as things were being pulled out of her bag, Hope started to get a little angry. We're gonna go ahead and let you take one of these in. I need both of those. You can't tell me that I can't use my personal hygiene for my body. I need both of those. Okay, I just talked to my supervisor, and she said, Could I speak with her, please? Because you guys are going a little bit to the extreme. Okay, I'm just letting you know that department's policy. And I'm asking you for some advice. Stayed. You're asking me to come in here without any type of lotion or oil for my skin. I'm a woman. You guys are really going to the extreme right now. No, no products with alcohol are we allowed. Need you need time. to abide by our policies, ma'am. After coming dangerously close to being denied her visit, Hope is allowed to proceed to the prison's gated conjugal unit. It's good things and bad things that you have to go through to get here. 
Okay. Hope says the difficulties of a prison visit are worth it. I knew who he was before I started coming to see him at the prison, and I liked him then because we were friends first. And that's what made our, us bond as um, lovers even better. And it was special because we didn't make love till we got married. And that's something that I never did before. So I was happy about that, too. What are you guys going to do for two days? <laughs> well, we're going to have fun. We're going to probably um, do a lot of exercise, jumping jacks, and stuff. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> Golden is finally escorted across the prison yard to the family visitation center. His long-awaited reunion with his wife is just moments away. I'm feeling marvelous. Extremely excited. You nervous? Mm -hmm. I know, this is, we ain't used to this. <laughs> you know, sometimes when a camera is in the room, people are not going to act naturally. And Ron and Hope both knew that we would be there for the beginning of the conjugal visit, certainly not during any part of the conjugal visit. Oh, the crew was real nice, very pleasant. But as I stood to the back of the room to get kind of a wide shot, I could hear them talking, saying, is he gone yet? Is he gone yet? They just wanted me out. But visitation is also bittersweet. Our crew saw how much so at Indiana State Prison when the family of inmate Jerry Bonds arrived for their first visit in months. To be honest, I grew up with a two-parent, middle-class home. You know, uh, my brother and, you know, my older brother, and they all graduated from college. You know, uh, I just happened to just be, uh, go down a wrong road with selling drugs and ripping around the streets. Bonds is serving 85 years for robbing a liquor store and killing the owner. I had two two daughters at the time, and my girlfriend at the time, she was pregnant with my son, so she was too much pregnant when I got locked up. That child, Bonds' son Eddie, was eight when we shot at Indiana. Even though he had never lived with his father, Eddie was missing him nonetheless. He actually shot a person, and he didn't mean to, but, then, but when I see him again, I was to live with them and be with them together so we can go to the park and the museum. His youngest son cries sometimes because he doesn't have his father around and there's some things that he really needs to be in his life for. But Bonds has had a tough time following the rules in prison as well. His last infraction was for attempting to intimidate an officer. That along with three urine tests that proved positive for marijuana has cost Bonds visitation privileges with his family. He had only recently gotten them back, but with restrictions. So right now, I'm, I'm on non-contact status. It's like through the phone and the glass. How did you react when your son told you that he wasn't going to have contact visits anymore? Well, I was upset at first, and I even threatened him to, uh, to not even bring his kids up here, you know? And, uh... I was very upset with him. As a matter of fact, I was so upset with him, I couldn't think straight. Bonds acknowledged that his actions, both in and out of prison, don't set the best example for his children. And it's like, how can I tell you guys to be good and do good in school and stay out of trouble, and every time you come and see me, I'm on restriction from visits, or I can't have visits because I'm in trouble. And they're like, well, you're kind of a hypocrite, Dad. You know, you're telling me to be good, but you're not being good. Our crew caught up with Bond shortly before his first visit with his children and parents in months. Your clothes are pressed, your boots look like shiny new. You want to look kind of kind of spit because it is a special day. You know, because your family do come, they have came from, from so far. It puts a smile on their face to see, okay, you are doing okay. You know, because they worry about me here. But first, Bonds would need to pass pre-visitation security measures, starting with his freshly pressed clothes. Yeah. All right, do me a favor, go ahead and completely disrobe. Despite the fact that he will not have physical contact, Bonds, like every other Indiana inmate, 
is strip searched prior to visitation. All right, this time open your mouth, please. Put your fingers in, spread your cheeks apart. Upper lip up, please. Lower lip down. Can you look inside your nose, please? Authorities must ensure that inmates are not attempting to pass contraband to the outside. Okay. Turn back around, squat call. <clears throat> All right, go ahead and get dressed. Meanwhile, the Bonds family has to pass through security as well. And even though it was nearly a three-hour drive to get here, Jerry Bond Sr. feels it's worth it. When a person is down, you really have to be there for them, you know? So what we try to relay back to Jerry is that we hope you get out of here sometime soon. And then when you do get out, you know, to pick up where you left off and show these kids that they're not just coming up here for, you know, nothing at all. I'm just anxious, man. I don't want to see him so bad. I wish I could touch him and hug him, but I guess this is better than nothing. Finally, the waiting is over. What's up, man? What's up? How y'all doing? Yeah. I got looking cute. Thank you. Look up. Let me see you. Let me get a smile, man. I ain't seen you in a while. How you doing in school? Good. Mm -hmm. Which grade you going to, Eddie? Well, the hardest part is like seeing him behind the glass and when I, he's in here and stuff. So I really want him to get out. When his kids can't hug him, like I told him, he's hurting his kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I can stand the hurt. Sometimes kids can't. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with Granddad? Let me speak to him. Hold on. Oh. What's going on, man? Hey, what's happening, Dad? How you doing? Staying strong? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey, thanks for bringing him up for me, Dad, man. Well, I want to let him know that we love him no matter what, but make it easier on us when we come up here. We're in here with you. Don't make it to where we're, we are locked up being locked up. You know what I'm saying? Hey. Okay, I ever told you I loved you? I ever told you I loved you? I love you guys. And I'm sorry, okay? Would you guys forgive me? Limited to only 30 minutes, the visit hardly seems to have begun when it's time to leave. I love you. Y'all be good. Bye-bye. All right, stay strong. Yes, sir. I'm praying, hoping, hoping that this is the last time they had to come up here like this and see me behind the glass, because it's not a good feeling. Not a good feeling. I just feel about um, when I don't see him anymore, I get sad, and when I see him, I get happy. I want him to be here, and then I don't want him to be here. I want him to, like, learn his lesson while he's here so that when he comes home, he knows right from wrong and know what to do and know what not to do. As a mother, I'd like to just touch him and, and are you okay? I want to give him a hug. And I haven't been able to do that, but I know one day I will. Coming up on Lock Up Bra, Prison Love. I love him to death. I'd do anything for Brad, anything, short of killing somebody again the family bonds that lead to murder, and later. One of the first things that I noticed was something that I never thought that I'd seen a million years on a prison yard, and that's all of the cats. When inmates adopt. Especially when they're little babies and you can raise them up, pet them, you feed them, you, you watch them grow, and that's your cat. one inmate might develop with another is often the only thing that helps them survive the bleak existence of a life behind bars. In some cases, those bonds have existed their entire lives. Over the years, lockup crews have discovered a surprising number of family members serving time together. But few have ever had to face the difficult circumstances that confronted Yvette and Doris Gay. Being on death row was... It was, it was like um, I, needed, I needed to be with my sister. The identical twins, both convicted of murder for helping Yvette's former boyfriend carry out a yeah. triple homicide, were sent to the North Carolina Correctional Institution for Women. Doris got a life sentence. Yvette was condemned to die. She told us about her first day on death row. I began to hear hurls and insults when I first got in the gate. I began to hear people talk about, oh, oh, she's got sentenced to death. Oh, she's, uh, she's gonna be, she's gonna die for the crimes that she committed. Even though they were housed at the same prison, 
the women were prohibited from seeing one another. But occasionally, Doris would catch a fleeting glimpse of Yvette. And I would go by the chapel, and I see my sister, she'd be in the window, you know, and I'd walk by with a group of ladies, and everybody would say, well, Doris, there's your sister. And I said, God, there she is. And I said, Lord, I wish she was out here, you know. And I hated to go by there just to see her, and it would hurt my heart, and, and I would ache. After six years of separation, Yvette's punishment was reduced to a life sentence, meaning she could leave death row and reunite with Doris. I was so excited for her, and she came and hugged me, and we were crying and kissing and hugging, and oh, it was just a, it was like a, a great reunion. <laughs> I started crying. I got emotional, and I just began to praise God. Though they can see each other on the yard, prison officials won't let the sisters share a cell for security reasons. They think we're the same person in the same dorm, the officers, and they get confused. It's interesting and kind of unusual for corrections because if, you, if you're not paying attention, you don't know who you're talking to. Um, is one of the reasons why we house them separately. Somehow I look. Yeah, you look wonderful. You look wonderful. That's my only brother. We're really close, we're really tight. We eat together, we live together, we work together. Our visit to the Anamosa State Penitentiary in Iowa led us to another memorable pair of siblings, Michael and Brad Love, whose lifelong allegiance drove them to kill. Growing up, I wanted to be him, you know? He was, he's almost four years older than me, you know? And I see him running around drinking and breaking into stuff and doing whatever he's doing, and I'm like, I'm gonna be like him, that's my big brother, that's my idol. And so, you know, I kind of followed in the same footsteps. But as the Love Brothers revealed to our crew, those footsteps led down a bloody path that ended at a holiday party in their trailer park. It was Christmas night, 1992. Me and my brother went to a party with what we thought were friends, but they tried to rob us to take the liquor that we had brought. And they just started beating me up. There was like four of them. They, they hurt Brad, I couldn't let him get away with that. They threatened his life. And I just, I couldn't handle that. So we left, went to my trailer. I got a shotgun, my brother got a knife, and a machete, and we went back out there and did what we did. I remember Mike standing there and he had the gun pointed up at the door of the trailer. And one of the dudes looked out the window and he was like, you, or whatever he said, and boom, then he shot. So I shot three people, he cut up two. We were both charged with uh, first degree murder, which carries a life sentence in Iowa. And, uh, well, that's it. Life means life means you don't ever get out. But Michael wasn't prepared to see his brother suffer that fate. Brad didn't kill anybody. I'm the one that, that shot and killed the, the guy. So I didn't think it fair for him to spend the rest of his life in prison. They come to me and say, if I pled guilty to first degree murder, they would plea bargain him down to a lesser time. So he plea bargained down to 125 years, which to me, that's still excessive, but it's better than a life sentence. He gets to go home where I'll probably end up dying in prison. That make you feel? It makes me feel like a piece of <laughs> really, man. <laughs> Here, my, my only brother. And because of something we did, and we did it together, and you know, he takes responsibility for his own actions. I don't know, man. It makes me feel like, like I'm that tall because I let it happen. I think in my mind that he's here because of me. So I carry that guilt around every day. He was 18. He turned 18 in county jail. He had a whole life ahead of him. He could have been a pro football player or a rock star, whatever he wanted to be. And I feel in my mind and my heart that I ruined that for him. And there's just, there's no way to explain how much guilt I carry around. The Love Brothers were initially incarcerated together at another Iowa prison. But once again, Brad followed Michael, and the result was more violence. The last fight that we got into, this guy told him my brother for smoking, for smoking weed. Mike told me, he said, here, I'm gonna go beat him up. He's like, I want you to shoot jiggers, watch out for us. I said, all right. So I stand outside the cell and Mike goes in there and I just, I don't know what made me do it, but I look in the window and it, it was only supposed to be one dude in there, but there was two guys and they was trying to get on Mike. And I was like, no, you know, that ain't gonna happen. So. I ran in there and I grabbed the other dude and beat him up pretty bad. And then they shipped me out and then that was it. Yeah. 
It sucked. Brad was transferred to Anamosa, only to find a long-lost relative was already doing his own time there. My father was in here messing with kids, and, you know, I ain't cool with that. And he tried talking to me, but I told him, I said, dude, I just can't, I ain't got no respect for you for what you did. I hate that. That's the worst crime that you can do, including the crime that I did of murder. I think that's worse. In 2003, their father died of a heart attack while still incarcerated. When their mother became ill, authorities approved Michael's request to be moved closer to her home, which reunited the brothers at Anamosa. It's just excited to see him again, man. It was, you know, it's my brother. Can't ask for a better m to hang out with. The Love Brothers may have found their place, but as we learned, their bond has yet to face its ultimate test. I'll never see him again. Once he gets out of prison, that's it. I'll never be able to visit my brother again because of Iowa law. Anybody on paper or parole can never visit anybody while they're incarcerated. Yvette and Doris Gay know all about that. Since our visit to the North Carolina Correctional Institution for Women, Doris has been paroled. The soonest she will be allowed to visit Yvette is in 2012 when her probation expires. Brad and Michael Love have more time. Brad is currently eligible, but has not yet made parole. So we're going to spend as many years together here as we can. I love him to death. I'd do anything for Brad, anything, short of killing somebody again. Coming up on Lock Up Raw, Prison Love. These cats is their kids. And you mess with one of the cats, I mean, these cats is their family. That's all they've got. The special bond between prisoner and pet. It's like anything, true with love and respect, it'll treat you with love and respect back. The social center of almost every prison is the yard. It's the rare space where inmates socialize, exercise, and occasionally fight to the death. But lockup crews have found that on some yards, even at dangerous maximum security institutions, inmates have found something to fill their hearts with love and nurturing, just not for each other. This is Bane. This is my buddy cousin Ted. Nobody's family home cat is, I could see, could be happier than these cats in here. One of the first things that I noticed when walking out of the yard in Kentucky was something that I never thought that I'd seen a million years on a prison yard. And that's all of the cats. They were all over the place. Nobody remembers exactly when dozens of stray cats began to adopt Kentucky State Prison as their home. And as our crew discovered, the inmates were more than happy to adopt the cats as pets. Especially when they're little babies and you can raise them up, pet them, you feed them, you watch them grow, and that's your cat. The like black kid. It was really amazing to see all of these felons, the guys that were in the state's maximum security penitentiary, with cats climbing all over them. They had them up on their shoulders, they were petting them constantly. And it was really interesting how the inmates had developed very, very nurturing relationships with these cats. We've got all kinds of cats, and you've got these guys here that these cats is their kids. And you mess with one of the cats, I mean, it's just like messing with my kids at home. I mean, these cats is their family. That's all they've got. And like any proud parent, the inmates shared photos of their favorite felines. We, we cat lovers up here. Now, here comes one. This is a monster right here. People had specific cats, and if you didn't want anything to happen to that cat, the last thing you were going to do is commit an act of violence that would send you to segregation where you couldn't care for it anymore. So in this funny little way, the cats contributed to a lower level of violence on that yard. The vet comes once a month, you can buy dry food and medicine and toys and stuff so, like that. So guys work hard at their jobs to earn their money. And they'll spend it on And they'll, sometimes their bet deals 60, 70, 80 bucks, takes everything they've got. Red, I wish you cats would get together and get rid of some of these rats we got running around this yard. <laughs> don't like rats, man. Yeah. <laughs> the people rats. Now, you leave the little bitty mice alone. We found an even more unlikely bond at California State Prison, Corcoran. It's like anything, true, with love and respect, it'll treat you with love and respect back. We were just kind of out on the yard shooting, and uh, I looked over it, and I saw these guys petting something. 
And at first I thought it was like a, a little a kitten, and it ended up it was a gopher that they had tamed. We shampoo them, you know, take, give them a little bath, so they don't bring the dirt mites in and uh, play with them and uh, let them run around in our cells, feed them apples, lettuce, take care of them, and they're good little pets. It's like the best companion I've ever had. A lot of the guys that we ran into uh, have probably never had anybody you know to love or anything or anybody to love them and you know when you run into somebody who is uh, you know adopted a gopher and it gives him some sort of outlet for affection uh, it, it's got to be a good thing but we found a very different case of inmate creature bonding inside california's san quentin state prison i'm mike miller is my real name and and the staff here call me the Birdman of San Quentin. The first day I got here at San Quentin, um, the birds seemed to have uh, flocked to me for some reason. And um, I don't know, they probably think I'm the Birdman of Alcatraz. Maybe they're mistaken, because he has a shaped head, too. Miller was serving an eight-year sentence for burglary when he proudly showed us his cell, a virtual shrine to his winged friends. And ever since I've been here, the birds just come up to me like they know me. You know, I got them landing on my shoulders and my hands and, you know, different kinds of birds, not just pigeons, but I got the, you know, the different kinds of blackbirds, like the finch and the red wing landing on me. I think the birds is a good way of um, releasing a lot of tension and anger. And before I got arrested, my girlfriend used to chase the birds away. She didn't want me around them, and so, well, now I'm in here, I have a chance to, to mingle with the birds. And um, basically, that's about the only friends I got, but birds, you know, I can't trust anybody else. 